Today's episode is sponsored by Coros. Coros is the leading customer engagement platform. From social media to online communities to digital customer care, Coros helps companies authentically connect with customers. Coros connects consumer insights across departments and helps companies run their businesses with their customers, anticipating their needs and accelerating sales. Coros works with over 2,000 brands, including 52 of the interbrand 100 companies and powers over 500 million digital interactions every day. Check them out at coros.com. That's K-H-O-R-O-S dot com. Hello and welcome to the Shiny New Object Podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton and this is a podcast about the future of marketing. Every week or so, I have the pleasure and the privilege to interview one of the leading lights of the industry. And this week is no different. I have Bonnie Chia, who is head of brand for WWF International. I was introduced to Bonnie by the guys at Future Conference. So Bonnie, welcome to the podcast. For those who don't know who you are and what you do please can you just say hi introduce yourself and let the audience know what you do so i'm part of wf's global communications and marketing team and as a head of brand for wf international along with a really a group of very dedicated colleagues we lead the global brand development for wwf um, the very beloved panda logo that many of you probably know and part of my portfolio for the past eight years is also leading the global strategy and planning for the world's largest grassroots movement, Earth Hour. And that is actually a sub-brand of WWF. And I'm very proud to say, you know, we've seen it grown. And this is something that I do day in, day out the last eight years. So enjoy this. I really enjoy my job. Fantastic. So keeping that introduction in mind, we're going to ask you some getting to know you questions to give us some understanding of who you are as a person and then we can get into your shiny new object. So Great. You, you've been doing an important and influential role. Um, but I imagine in the, in the years you've been there, you, you must have been through some changes in, internally and externally. But what kind of new beliefs and behaviours have you taken on in the last five years or so that you feel have really made a difference to your career? You know, um, working in not-for-profit is actually um, not the only job I've ever had. I've been in commercial agencies background prior to this um, really wonderful career, this wonderful job. And what I've learned that, you know, conservation, environment, you know, it's they're not going that well, right? So um, it's very, some it's very devastating facts I'm facing day in and day out. So one of the things that I've learned um, and a new, I was a new belief the last, you know, five where I started this job five, six years, you know, um, to really kind of start taking on is surrounding myself with people I really admire, who I want to be more like of, you know, and that really seems like a small action, but I have felt the difference. So when I'm with a group of people who I not only enjoy working with, but also admire, I find myself upping my own standards work and deliver beyond and above my own expectations of myself. And I think that really is that kind of energy, that positive energy. And I hope I spread the positive energy with my colleagues. That's such a unusual thing to say. One line, which was, <laughs> I surround my people, um, excuse me, I surround myself with people that I want to be more like, which is they're very, very humble. It's like, you're, you are better than me. And I, I want to be like you. And I think that's, that's a oh, really absolutely. beautiful thing. It reminds me a lot of, I, I mean, this is, this is awful Instagram pop psychology, but basically says that you, you're as happy as the five, sorry, you're as happy as the average of the five people that you spend most of your time with, but also you ah, earn, nice. you earn as much money as the average of the five people that you spend most of your time with. And I don't know who's calculated that and it's probably BS, but <laughs> I think that, but there's something in that you you, you grow Absolutely. you grow to you know you you skill up to the level that you play at right Absolutely, I totally agree with that I think you know that's that's a really that's a really nice line I'm gonna steal that quote Yeah, you can put it on a, a background of a beach with like a handwritten style on Instagram <laughs> and you, you know you'll be a you'll be a motivational influencer before, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> So, so you, so you say yes to working with inspirational people that you can learn from, that you want to want to want to be like and you know, up your game. But what have you become better at saying no to in the past 
five years in that same time? I have to say, I have to admit that I haven't been very good at saying no. And I think that's just part of my personality. But I, I'm very proud, on the other hand, very proud to do share that I have learned to better at saying no to some meetings and calls in terms of my work. Um, and I know it's, it seems, again, like a small action. But um, I've learned to really empower my team and, you know, really try to have calls that are, can do without me. And I think that part of it is my journey becoming a mother. I think, you know, when you're juggling between a full-time job and motherhood and, you know, your time is limited. And I've really learned to become really efficient and maximize impact with minimal time I have. And I've stopped almost all procrastinations. I wouldn't say all, but almost. And really taking a deeper care in what, you know, what I want to interact with, what meetings can I join and can I not join? How can I be a better person or how can I better help the team when I join that meeting? How do I deliver that and really help the team to deliver big impact? And, you know, with, you know, with NGOs, oftentimes we have limited budget, limited resources, um, but at the same time, it becomes even more critical at better managing those resources. So it's really kind of improving my own management of the team um, kind of in that way um, to, to learn to say no, because then they can learn how to take on things on their own as well. So I'm really interested to hear more about how motherhood has forced you into not procrastinating. Do you, I, I had a similar <laughs> conversation with Anastasia, who's the CEO of Castle Labs, a startup that I, we partner with from time to time. Uh, and she said that, I mean, she was, I think, three or four years into her entrepreneurial journey and, and had a baby. And, and now she's like, wow. I just spend far less time doing things and I just mm. get, get on with it. I cut to the chase. And she feels that her work's not, that hasn't suffered, but has actually got better because of that. Because, you know, if you have 12 hours to do some work, you'll spend 12 hours on it, right? But if you've got 12 minutes, you probably get it to most of the way there if you get your head down is, is that the same do you feel if you stop procrastinating exactly. because you have no time or because you have well, a different technique that's a very interesting i think that it's a little bit of both i mean you know it's it's kind of that that pressure of last minute you know how you feel right before an exam comes around you feel like you want to like really study and that kind of your adrenaline is focused on that task and never before have you been that focused on that particular subject it's a little bit like that the cut or trade chase you know go straight into the work um, but at the same time, motherhood also gives me a different perspective on things, which has actually helped my work immensely. Um, really thinking about things in a slightly different perspective. It means, you know, it doesn't mean that I stop thinking about work when I'm not at work. It just that means that I'm almost like, you know, when I'm midpoint of resting or trying to get things done, I'm thinking about how to solve that problem in different ways. And my kids, even in some way, challenges me on doing that. And that actually makes me, means that it makes me feel wanting to work when I'm working even more so because I've got that, you know, moment of time to myself and really deliver something. So I feel that kind of adrenaline, that focus, you know, kind of like you're waiting, going eagerly, going back to work, you're eagerly having that moment of that moment to yourself and deliver something that you can do on your own suddenly becomes really precious. And um, that's kind of, I guess, in a, a, a cheating myself kind of technique in delivering that impact and delivering that result. So that's how I do it. I feel like the adrenaline really drives me my focus and I kind of build up. And then when I'm at work in front of a computer, I'm like, yes, I'm on it. I can do this right now. <laughs> yeah. this, um, so kids provide a surplus of adrenaline that um, <laughs> drive you through everything at an incredible rate. I said, um, well, that's, yeah, um, I'm a, a fairly uh, new dad myself, so I can definitely relate to that. So, so it's great that you're saying no to things and you have a, an extra wind in your sails because of you being a mom and you delegate. But what happens when you do get overwhelmed when the, the ask is greater than your ability to deliver it? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it happens way too frequently, I think. So, <laughs> I think um, I really try to get out of the office, get out of the physical space I'm currently in that I feel frustrated about. I think taking yourself physically away from a certain space that frustrates you, a situation that frustrates you, really helps you to think. So whether it's stand up, 
you know, when you were sitting down or if you're already standing up doing work, then I would say sit down, have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Just physically changing that space, physically changing your, your position really actually helps me. And, you know, I, you know, I work on conservation. I we talk about communications. We talk about how important nature is. I actually think being, and, you know, it's been proven. Like nature really help, heals us emotionally. It makes us happier, feel better, uplift our mood. All of that is actually scientific. So, I mean, really being closer to nature. Take a moment, you know, you have a backyard. Go to the backyard, you know, go to the park, take a walk. All of those things are actually really, um, really helps. Even drink a glass of water. Just having that conscious moment is really, really important. So that's what I do to distress. I mean, I don't really have time to do other stuff. So <laughs> I do these little small actions that help me take away from that moment of stress. So you've given some really great advice for people who are potentially mid-career or you know, juggling things like kind of parenthood and career and managing a team and some really lovely stuff there. But what kind of advice would you give to someone who's entering into marketing that wants to be a head of brand at some point but their first job but assuming that they're really great at doing all the basic stuff what advice would you give someone to get into this business wow and succeed? yeah be curious be persistent be humble okay i think that's three advices <laughs> but um i would really say one of the most important thing is to persist, you know, it seems that it's really hard to persist in these days and age, you know, especially when things are always changing so rapidly, you know, especially if this is your first job, you're fresh out of school, or if, you know, you know, or you're in, you know, in second job even, because I think, I think we, we constantly deal with changes, you know, quite, quite well, media is changing, the landscapes, our environment's changing, but yet we're not, we, it's hard for us to keep determined persistence, and I think that's something that's a really quality to have um, or to really try to do more of that. And especially marketing. I think the foundational work in marketing, if you start out as a new job, very basic, like you know, researching, media monitoring, even if you're doing public relations, they're very this, they may seem really boring in the beginning. But I've found these basic um, groundwork, you know, really pay off in the end. The truth is, you know, how can we really market something without understanding thoroughly what the product is, our competitors? or our media, what our media are saying, or without understanding our audiences. So all of these are the groundwork in better understanding, you know, who, what are we marketing? So I feel like if you're in your first marketing job and you feel this is all very, you know, basic, and it's what am I doing doing this groundwork? I think take in that groundwork because you might miss it one day to just be able to read, you know, I just want to be able to consume media, read wonderful, you know, news articles and learn more about things that you don't have. Sometimes I feel that I don't have time to learn these things. I'm doing a lot of strategic work, but not able to learn the groundwork. But the groundwork is actually what the foundation of marketing is. So I would say stay determined, you know, explore, be curious, ask questions. If this is your first job, it's okay to ask questions. At least I feel it's okay to ask questions. So when, when, my, when my junior staff ask me questions and I think being humble can really take people really far it really allows one another to share with you like their learnings and the treasures and their you know the histories and where they come from how, you know what that they're learning in their jobs and it really helps to build um, that relationship so these I hope these tips will help distinguish that person from others I think these are some really good things I've seen so being humble can take you really far and it really allows other people to share with them you know their learnings and treasures and histories and the experiences that they had. So it really helps someone grow. So these are some things that I've seen that um, really distinguish our junior staffs um, in our interns that have interned with us and that these are the qualifications they've done. These are the qualifications that they've shown. So you've just talked about people entering the industry, but how about you at the end of your career? How do you want people to remember Bonnie? I hope people will remember me that I've made a difference, um, you know, in the work I deliver or even in someone's lives, you know, um, influencing others with my positivity. That's something that I've always been very proud of that, you know, I want to deliver that positive energy. I've learned to be humble in my own dreams. I think changing the world is a really big, almost a bit scary, a great dream to have, but quite scary. Uh, but I realized what's really important is about taking these small, making these small changes every day. You know, it's about helping one person one day with a task, help, you know, helping um, a company with something, delivering something that helps something else. And I think in this case, I would have liked to have remembered that 
and make positive differences, you know, whether it's as big as, you know, contributing to the climate action movement or as small as helping a student to get a meaningful job somewhere. You know, I will confidently, I can, conf I want to be able to say confidently that I've tried my best to make this world a slightly better place, if not a lot better. If you love all things innovation and want to understand how brands plan to emerge stronger from the current situation, don't forget to check out Madfest London on the 11th and 12th of November. My good friend Dan at Madfest knows how to put on a cracking event and there's always plenty of amazing speakers, beer and cool people to meet. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. What we're going to do now, now we, now we understand who Bonnie is, we're going to talk about your shiny new object. And your shiny new object is the open source brand. So I'm very passionate about creating open source brand. Um, and open source brand is what allows people and communities and other brands to get involved, multiply the efforts of that brand, and people can be amplifiers and transform passions into movements. And what is open source exactly? You know, it's beyond, it's a concept originally developed for as more of a technology aspect, uh, more for building softwares. So some examples we've seen oftentimes use open source are like um, popular ones like Mozilla, Firefox, Drupal, Chromium, these are all type of open source technology, right? And we see them day in, day out, and you know, our, the reason why they really grow with the community is that people can leverage these technology that's already been built and improve and modify it, you know, and um, use it for free, and that everyone is able to improve that technology for the better of usage. So that same concept, concept transform into open source brand means that everyone, anyone can leverage this brand ethos, or there is a particular visual, it's open, it could be open source marketing visual, it could be open source brand like Earth Hour, anyone, everyone can take on this brand and deliver it in the way that you want to deliver in aligning to the ethos and purpose of this brand. So an example of Earth Hour, which is an open source brand, is that um, Earth Hour gives away its logo, its visual, and every year there's a new campaign that comes together, together and people are able to use Earth Hour to help delivering the message of uniting the world for a better planet, to save the planet. And so, for example, Starbucks around the year would use Earth Hour and they would have an Earth Hour promotion, they would talk about reusable cups, they would do a series of activities around that in their local countries. And does Earth Hour come to, uh, does the Starbucks come to Earth Hour for permission? No, they don't have to, because they're aligning to the ethos of Earth Hour, the purpose of saving our planet, and they're already aligning to our ethos, and therefore they can use it and deliver and help us amplify the message in the way that they see best fit in their customers, in their audiences. And that's how they amplify message for the brand. So how does this work practically? So I get it and it sounds incredible and not something I was familiar with, but so it's great that someone as massive as Starbucks would want to come on board and, and align themselves with your, your ethos. But what happens when a brand comes on board with it, but doesn't do it in the right way? Do you have to police that or does the community self-police it? How, how, did, how do you deal with the good and bad of anyone being able to use your brand and its image? That is such a great question. And I think, um, I think you're, you're, that's a really great question. So the, the, the issue, you know, and, and as many brands will worry about, and EarthR is a brand that's owned by WWF. So WWF owns uh, EarthR trademark um, and copyright around the world. Um, how does WWF protect the EarthR brand when it's an open source brand? We actually, we have the legal right um, in defending the brand when the brand is being misused by you know, a company that's used it for profit. Okay, so you cannot use Earth Hour for profit. You're using Earth Hour to trans transmitting a message and amplifying our message. But we have not yet had the need to do any legal um, you know, proceedings or you know, dispute. The reason is because the community fights on our back. When a brand takes Earth Hour in the wrong light and shines in the wrong light or use it for any 
commercial purposes for profit that is not aligned to our mission, the community will fight back. And the community will say, that's not, that's not the right way to do it. They will backlash mm -hmm. that brand. It actually will give the brand a very negative light when they use or they want to take advantage of a brand such as Earth Hour. So I think this is where it's a really kind of a community police kind of situation where, and especially now in days when everything is so transparent on the internet, right? We have social media and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot more conversations happening in the public, whether it's from Twitter, whether it's comments on Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. The idea of that community police is actually very, very strong. And we, you know, the supporters will stand out to defend the brand for us. And we don't need to normally need to do that. Usually the brands will remove any negative usage, et cetera. So I can understand how Earth Hour being an open source brand can work and sounds like it is incredibly successful, but as a shiny new object, is this something that a more traditional brand could do? Could a fast moving consumer goods brand be an open source brand or could uh, have you seen an example of a traditional brand using this or a new brand who's new to market doing this now, that's a really good question as well i think we have i've had so many discussions with a lot of brands about it about the opportunity of looking at open source brand um i will say that not many brands have tried this out. I have not seen an example that's global. Um, I've seen lots of local communities doing it. So, or, or influencers, for example. So there's the Greta uh, movement for the climate change recently and the video she created, in a way it's open source. So I see a lot more on content creation, not necessarily on brand. I do think that there is, um, that being an open source brand needs require a few things. You do need to have a mission that aligns with people beyond, it shouldn't be for profit in the sense of it's quite difficult when it's for profit, because why would I, as a consumer, drive you for profit, um, helping you amplify this brand, unless there's mm. something in it for me, right? But if it's easy if it's a social cause, right? Because then I'm doing it for the betterment of the world. So I can help you amplify that message. So how does a profit, profit, profit work in this scenario? You know, why wouldn't we think about and challenge that? Why wouldn't we think an FMCG, you know, could be a big one like PNG Unilever when they think about their campaigns, the amount of money they pour in into communications work. Why wouldn't they think about how can they create something that's useful beyond just for the industry maybe even that's useful for beyond that you know and i think that's something that's really interesting thinking about how will we challenge the current way of brand development how can we think about what is in it for both the consumers and the brand and can we can there be a business model that's different that it doesn't work in the current traditional business model but could it work in the future i think a lot of startups are toying with that idea of having a i wouldn't say sub brand but campaigns that are open source that you know, but that's for good. And that's getting people to rally up and amplifying the message. So do you think it has to be the campaign that's open source or can it be the whole brand itself? You mentioned some small local yeah. examples. Can you be good yes. to hear about those as well? Sure. Um, so I know that there is a, um, a community school in, uh, in Singapore that they do, um, they do kind of an open source brand, so-called. I think it's called uh, uh, Five for Me. And it's something that where they kind of get, you know, it, they create a little visual and then they get kids to, um, to support it and everyone can wear and be part of that club. And the idea is that club is kind of open source because all the kids can join and give nature tours around nature's and talk about, you know, conservation for the environment, conservation for various for nature's, et cetera. And it's kind of an open source because it's about, it's not about, you know, using that logo. It's about spreading that logo, right? Everyone can be an amplifier mm. of that. Yeah. And I've seen, um, there's a, there's a walk that's, um, uh, that actually is a really good example as well. There's a walk about learn the heritage of uh, Jane's Walk. So it's learn the heritage of, um, of your city and your town. And it's also kind of an open source community movement. The idea is that, you know, Jane's Walk is that it's, um, it gives a little, like kind of a booklet. It become a Jane's Walk um, tour person. And that teaches you um, how, what are the criteria, what are the things you must do. You must show heritage site of your location, you know, put in your information here, you must host three walks, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bit of a criteria and you can become part of the network. And that's also free. The idea is about 
letting people to learn, helping people to learn, understand the culture of your local community, the heritage of your local um, environment, and that you are more closer, you're closer to the environment you live in, and you, therefore you will care for it and love it. So there's a lot of small little kind of movements, community movements as such. So how would you feel if I said something like, is TripAdvisor an open source brand? Because it, the, the product, the thing, is supplied by uh, people who use it and they, you know, they align to the idea of um, educated travel or you know, like they had a good experience or a bad experience and then they want to share that with people also on the same path. But yeah, it, it's commercial and it exists right. under the TripAdvisor banner. I, is that, is, yeah. have I missed the point so, here? Yeah, so I would say TripAdvisor will be closer to a crowdsourced community. So it's really the crowd powered, right? It's, it's, it's the, they needed the people to come in and put in their, put in and their feedback comments and have this conversation therefore then you know you can start building that you know that database to review and to um to gain that traction so people will go to TripAdvisor for more comments as you add more comments to it so i would say that's probably more of a crowd power crowd source um rather than open source but however if TripAdvisor say that you know what i'm going to do something that's called trip community which is hypothetically speaking and it's called Hub Tripcom, and you know this is a Tripcom. It's a little visual logo that's you know for people who are um, uh, who wants to be uh, who wants to be uh, certified in uh, in taking a little free online course, and they are going to be people who are going to help us evaluate um, um, our our destinations, and they are they can help us host sessions and to teach about travel safety, et cetera, et cetera. So mm, it's, it's about giving right. them a bit of ownership. You need to empower people for something, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to empower people for something that allows them to take that beyond. So TripAdvisor currently, the certification of, you know, of destination, they are a very, it's a very rigorous process that they will have a certain process. So those logo you see on the, you know, what is on restaurants or in, in front of a hotel, those are certified by TripAdvisor. But they don't allow that to be open source, right? Because no one can take that piece and say, I want to stick it onto my door. Yeah, but right. if there is something but if there's something about <laughs> spreading for something for purpose spreading for purpose and that you want to grow that message and it's kind of like door to door or like you know i share that message to my community and my community would then share that message further out for purpose then i think there is something there so i you know i think brands should really think about it because i think that it would for one the amplification of that is you know it's really word of mouth and it's really about it's really about leveraging the community but why will we empower community for something it has to be something that's meaningful for the community to do so therefore that empowerment that meaningful aspect needs to be in there and i think you know all profit companies should still think about that it doesn't mean it's only limited to not-for-profit i think that it sh there should be an opportunity in looking at that but the empowerment must be something meaningful yeah i think i think that's so interesting it reminds me I, I just can't remember who the guest was on this podcast, but they said that a campaign lasts as long as a campaign lasts, but a mission can last a lifetime. I think that is the, oh, what seems to be so the, the, the difference between you know, having an open source element of your brand is that you, you hand it over to the people that it's important yes. to, for them to, their, re, to reinterpret, remix, but also distribute yes. it across uh, the, a, a network of people who share their views. Bonnie, I'm going to have to leave it there. I'm really sorry. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. So many good things there and such an unusual shiny new object. I, I, feel, that, I feel educated uh, massively there. So, so thank you. And that's really going to change the way I think about some of the work that we do. So thanks so much for that. Thank uh, you. Very welcome. If you're, uh, if anyone listens, listening to this is uh, in anywhere near Singapore next week, you can go to the Future Conference. That's FUTR. Uh, um, I'm pretty sure there's still some availability. Uh, but Bonnie, if people wanted to speak to you directly, how would you like them to do that? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn on, um, yeah. And or they can also, yeah, that's uh, just Bonnie Chia, B-O-N-N-I-E, C-H-I-A. Can I think I'm probably the only one. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I'm probably not. But it's linkedin.com slash um, in slash Bonnie Chia. Brilliant. I can leave it there. I think I'm the only one. Brilliant. What a lovely way. What a lovely chat. Thank you so much, Bonnie. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, just before you go, 
I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the Shiny New Object Podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, or whatever it's called these days, or whichever podcast provider you use. We're an indie podcast, so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels. That would just be fantastic. If you haven't got time, that's also cool. And yeah, if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also, if possible, don't forget to subscribe. And I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, If you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.